What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 513 of Get Paid for Your Pad. Today, I'm super excited to be welcoming Mr. Daniel Kalinoff on the podcast. He's the Chief Investment Officer at Diversus, which is a boutique private equity fund that invests in hospitality and affordable housing. And we're going to talk about uh, how to combine those businesses. We're going to talk about fundraising. Uh, we're going to talk about scaling, uh, scaling a short rental business. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be powerful. I'm excited to have you on Daniel. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much, Jasper. Really appreciate it. First of all, I'm going to change my virtual background. So it's more appropriate for the topic we're going to be discussing today. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah that, looks, uh, that looks more inspiring. What, 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 I don't know where that is, but I would love to go there. Absolutely. That's that's in beautiful Belize, not too far from where you're standing right now. So, Right. And I know you're working on a really cool project down there, right? Yeah. We're, uh, we're building our, our, our investing in our second um, luxury hotel project down there. And um, really, if it weren't for short-term rentals in the US, uh, none of this business model uh, would have evolved. So yeah. um, excited well, to share. We'll, uh, we'll get into that. But uh, I, I know you... I think your your background stories are inspirational, so I wanted to start with that. Can you tell us like um, how you uh, how you moved to the U.S. and like what the early years were like, and how you got into the short term rental business? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I was born in Russia, which was actually the former Soviet Union, and um, just like we have a you know crazy dictator uh, scaring people away from that country today. It wasn't too different, uh, you know, 45 years ago when when I left, um, my mother was looking for, um, you know, better opportunities for me and for herself. So she, after five years of being refused by the uh, KGB and Soviet government, finally got permission to leave. And we made our way to the U.S. and she came here with, um, you know, a little boy, a suitcase and a couple hundred bucks. Uh, didn't know anyone, uh, didn't speak the language that well, and started off pretty much from scratch, uh, clawing her way up, pursuing the American dream. You know, took uh, took 20 years, and she went from basically uh, be doing you know remedial janitorial work to being an executive at a Fortune 500 company, and um, you know. It, she was doing all the things that you were supposed to do in terms of protecting your financial future, primarily um, taking a little piece of your paycheck and setting it aside in your 401k and in investing in the market. And uh, when the dot-com bust of the early 2000s rolled around, she lost a huge percentage of her retirement funds and didn't really understand why. Um, she said, you know, hey, I've been doing all the right things. I'm meeting with my advisor. I'm looking at all these pretty pie charts. Everything looks good. I'm diversified. Um, but it was really at that point in time when I realized, you know, there's no way that I'm going to leave my family's financial future up to this market thing that increasingly people, I think, don't understand and certainly can't control. Um, I think all of the volatility we've seen in the last 12 months is is perfect, you know, proof of that. And so I set out to try to find other ways um, after college to diversify my overall livelihood um, so that I wasn't met with the same fate that unfortunately my mom was back in the early 2000s. And that's what led me to real estate investing. And did you start out with short term rentals or did you go into like flipping or long term rentals first? Yeah, so first we did it the traditional way. Uh, my wife and I bought a, uh, a, my girlfriend at the time, we decided to buy a home together, fix it up. We lived in it for a little while and then moved out and rented it. Um, and then did that a few more times. Uh, we were living in Denver, Colorado at the time. Um, and, and while that was a great learning experience, we quickly realized that that model was going to be really slow going mm -hmm. um, if we wanted to diversify. And really, our goal was to, um, you know, practice being who we were becoming. Right. So the American dream says, just put your head down, work really hard for 40 years, save up a pile of cash. And then one day when you decide you don't want to work anymore and you want to hang up your spurs you're going to give that pile of cash to somebody and they're going to turn that into mailbox money for you. Right. And that's, that's how you're supposed to do it. Um, and, and that just didn't make sense to us. We were like, well, why don't we just start practicing 
generating our own mailbox money today so that we can have that financial freedom sooner than when we're 59 and a half. And that was our driving goal. And we realized that owning a bunch of single family homes, it was just going to take forever to do that. Um, so we moved to San Diego uh, in the early 2000s. I, I graduated from business school. I went to a business school in Boston trying to figure out, okay, what is it that the people on Wall Street know that I don't know and that I could maybe use to protect myself from what happened to my mom? And what I learned there primarily was that most of my colleagues, they were not interested in protecting Joe Main Street. They wanted to go work for big investment banks and actually make the divide between Wall Street and Main Street even bigger and introduce even more confusing products, right? So, mm -hmm. so my business school experience just cemented this idea in my head that the market is sort of rigged and definitely stacked against the average individual investor. So we moved to San Diego and we were talking about having a kid and we had lived in a duplex and we were renting out the bottom of the duplex long-term and when we decided that we were going to start thinking about having a child, we said, you know what, why don't we throw the bottom unit up on this VRBO thing? Because that way we could have some flexibility if grandma and grandpa want to come visit, whatever. And we were getting, um, we were getting, I think it was 1500 bucks a month for that unit, maybe two grand a month. Um, and after the first 30 days of being on VRBO, we were almost 70% booked for the rest of the year and we were getting $14.95 a week, right? Mm. So you don't have to be a math major to figure out that $14.95 a week times three weeks, right? Like, because you're only booked 75% of the time is much better than two grand a month. And so that's when the epitome, epiphany hit us. And we were like, oh, wow, if we just do this like 10 or 20 more times, then we're done. We're, we're out of the rat race. Um, and we both had really good W-2 jobs. I worked in the medical device field. My wife worked in biotech. And we basically decided just to save every penny we could and buy as many more duplexes and triplexes in San Diego as we possibly could and expedite that path out of the rat race. Awesome. And um, how many of those duplexes and triplexes did you end up buying? So that's a great question. We we ended up buying probably a total of four, which was like 12 units-ish, 10 to 12 units. Um, but in the coastal markets, especially in Southern California, I mean, you're paying, you know, 750 to a million bucks. This was back in 2008, 2009. Um, and it's very easy to quickly run out of your own money, right? And that was how our fundraising and our private equity fund was born is that we ran out of our own capital very quickly, but we had a network of friends around us, many of whom were, you know, high net worth W2 individuals, either in the medical space or in law, um, who were looking at what we were doing. And they were like, Hey, if you guys want to do another one of these like short-term rental things, we would love to come along the ride with you. You know, we'd love to give you 100 grand, 50 grand, and we want to invest alongside you. The problem is I had no idea how to legally and responsibly accept that check. You know, I had friends who were like taking 100 grand from Uncle Vinny and, you know, <laughs> doing it sort of um, doing it as a pastime or a hobby, I guess. Um, but we really saw that this could be a way that we could not only grow you know, our own net worth, but also help other people who were struggling to find creative ideas outside of just the market. Mm -hmm. So that's how kind of our fund was born. Um, I left corporate America and spent about a year learning the ins and outs of raising capital, um, how, to, how to appropriately document the securities because you are, you know, you're raising securities, you're, you're giving people something to invest in. And with that comes a lot of responsibility. So, um, so, so really running out of our own capital is what gave us the, the impetus to, to take it to the next step and figure out how to do that on a professional basis. Yeah. 
So what will your advice be to people who are listening right now thinking like, hey, I would like to raise some money too. Like what, what are some beginner's mistake to avoid and, and what are some first steps for those people? Yeah, so I think the first step is be the person you're you're becoming. Um, define who you are and why you have the right to even accept money from somebody or raise money, right? So some people listening may have a regular day job, right? And real estate investing or their short-term rental business is a side hustle. But that doesn't mean that you're not qualified, right? If you're somebody who has proof of concept, you know, you own one, two vacation rentals or whatever, but somebody knows you as Jasper, the podcast host, right? Or Jasper, the engineer, or whatever your main thing is, you want to pivot and really talk about the deals that you've done and how the light in which your network knows you is only one side of you, right? But in fact, you have been a very successful investor. Um, you have proof of concept and don't get um, imposter syndrome because where you're like, hey, I'm not, I, I shouldn't really be raising money. I don't, I don't have the right to, to do that. You know, you do, you have to switch your mentality where if you found something great, like, earning a really solid income through short-term rentals, you should share that knowledge, right? You should send the elevator back down and help those around you participate. Um, that was sort of our mindset, right? And so, yes, you may not have done it in the past, right? You may not be as seasoned as a mutual fund manager or somebody who does this for a living, but you know the ins and outs of your business, so all you need to do is really learn the ins and outs of how to raise the capital. Um, and along those lines, I think I would definitely recommend getting a good securities attorney, right? And having somebody help you with the paperwork because there's, there's really two sets of paperwork. One is all the legalese, right? Which is called the PPM, the private placement memorandum. And it has, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of subscription agreement, operating agreement, all this stuff. And then there's sort of the marketing stuff that you put in front of investors just to familiarize them with the deal, right? So I think putting together a short, you know, five or six page executive summary, and it doesn't have to be beautiful, right? You just want to get the basic concepts down of, why am I choosing this market? Why am I choosing this specific property type? How much money are we trying to raise in this deal? What is the time frame for which I'm going to invest your, your capital, right? Because a lot of times you either have a deal and it's ready to go, but you don't have the money, or you have a bunch of money sitting around, but you're out there looking for the perfect opportunity, right? What one of my mentors talks about it like milk and cereal. You know, when you get to the bottom of the cereal bowl, there's either too much milk left over and you got to add the cereal, right? <laughs> or there's too much cereal left over and you got to get more milk. So it's the same thing with raising capital. You you have to get in, in stride where by the time you find that perfect property or that perfect deal, there's enough cash sitting in the bank that you can close quickly and that you're a serious contender. Right. So explaining that in your in your documentation, I think, is really, really important. Um, and then, you know, making direct contact is also important. So going through your rationale on a one on one basis, I think, is the best way to really cement a relationship with an investor. A lot of people make videos, you know, they do social media posts, um, which is great. Like, you can you can do a video and send out a YouTube link to a hundred people in your network, and that is awesome. But in the case of raising money, especially when you're just getting started, I think there's no substitute for do even if it's a Zoom call. I mean, if you can do lunch and sit down in person with your documentation, right? That's the best. So a face to face discussion of why you think this is a great idea and why you're qualified is the best way to really, um, I think, get that potential investor across the goal line. And, um, you know, face-to-face -face communication is kind of a lot, it's becoming a lost art, but you got to remember that you are also educating your investor on a whole new way to potentially 
transfer money, right? Which is private equity. So most people are not familiar with putting private equity into a deal. They don't know that they can actually use their 401k plan or their IRA to invest in your vacation rental, right? So you need to educate them on that. And by the time that you're done with that meeting, you've educated them not only on why you think your deal makes sense, but also how they can invest with either cash, right? Post-tax money or retirement money. And so that person goes through this educational process. And by the time they're done, they probably know more about your deal than they do about any stock or mutual fund or ETF in their own portfolio. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and that is a very um, powerful service that you can provide to your investors, which is training them to get into the deal flow, right? Like Jasper, maybe this deal that I'm, we, we're talking about today isn't the right opportunity for you, right? My my short term rental is in Texas, but you live in San Diego, and for the first one, you know you don't feel comfortable investing out of state. You want to be able to drive by it, lay eyes on it. And that's something that's really important to you and maybe whoever else the decision maker in your family is. No problem. Totally get it. Well, let's have you looking at other deals in your local market then, right? Let's have you start to analyze this deal and compare it to other similar things. And even if you want to compare the returns of my project to the returns of the S&P 500 over the last decade, That's good too, right? You need to have as many compared to what's as possible. And so I think to the extent that you can encourage your network and your investors to go out and look for more private placement opportunities, the more you're really helping them to broaden their scope and ultimately become better equipped to protect themselves and their family as they go down the road in in defining their financial future. Mm -hmm. People think that because they have stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, they're diversified. But that's like saying, hey, I have strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla, so I'm good. I don't need to look at the dessert menu, right? Those, those Those three asset types are all within the same asset family, right? Securities, but what about real estate? What about crypto? What about precious metals? What about collecting art? I mean, there's so many other things that you Mm -hmm. should be adding to your portfolio, but nobody really gets paid a commission for the most part when you learn how to take your 100 grand out of your 401k and put it in a real estate deal in Belize. No one gets paid on that. So the industry isn't designed to educate us that this is an option. And that's where we come in as syndicators and and fund managers. Yeah, I love the I love the mindset of you know going up to investor with your documentation or some people might call that like a pitch, like investor pitch, right? Um, but not not just to pitch that person, but to educate that person on the opportunity of investing in short term rental real estate in general, right? Um, I think that's awesome. And then number two is I really relate to what you're saying when it comes to diversifying. Uh, Cause I'm also in my mind, I'm always thinking like in different scenarios, like scenario one, right? We have massive inflation scenario two, we have an enormous depression scenario three, right? And then think of like, what, how are my assets going to perform under those scenarios? And then I, you know, and then diversify, as you said, um, one of my investments is, uh, is in a, a big coffee farm in Colombia. And the rationale behind that is like, well, no matter what happens, people want to drink coffee. You know what I mean? So yeah, and and probably even drink more of it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So I totally, uh, yeah, totally on the same page with you there. Um. For the people that are listening who don't know what a private what private equity means, can you explain that? Yeah, it's sort of this. Um. This, this weird nebulous term, right? People hear private equity, you know, and um, when I meet somebody in an elevator, I don't say that I run a private equity fund because that is not very approachable. You know, that just sounds very like pie in the sky, but really all it means is taking money from individuals and putting into projects that make sense, right? So in, in, in my world, 
And so it means really um, introducing people to the, the notion that you should be looking at things to invest in on a regular basis. And then me holding their hand, at least initially through that process. So when we get on a call and we talk about, hey guys, we're going to be adding another you know, three short-term rentals to our portfolio. We're raising a million bucks. Um, you know, we're going to spend 4 million bucks. We're going to get a loan for three. We're going to do these improvements. And then this is what the income stream may look like over time. People start asking tons and tons of questions, right? They start grilling you hard. And, and, and we love that, right? To me, that is the private equity process. It's, Hey, Danny or Jasper or whoever, I'm about to wire you, you know, 100K from my IRA. Um, I really want to make sure that A, I'm going to get my money back. B, you know, what does the exit look like? C, what are the returns? What are the risks? Which is funny because if you go and you buy a share of Apple or Tesla or Starbucks, are you reading the prospectus? Are you looking at all the risks and, you know, 400 pages of disclosures in those companies' paperwork? No, of course not, because it's a known entity. So you don't necessarily feel compelled to do the same level of diligence, but you should be, right? And so really that's what private equity is. It's private people pooling funds in order to do a deal that's bigger than any one deal that they could do on their own. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that most of the real estate in the world is owned like that. I mean, Private equity goes back 5,000 years, right? When you have you have families that get together and live on a farm or put pool their collective resources to create something that's that's where the where the where the total is bigger than the sum of the parts, right? And that's all it is. Is like it seems really difficult to go buy, you know, for example, this this you know this island, right? I mean, let's just say let's say the island is 10 million bucks. Actually, that's a bad example. Let's say you want to buy a strip mall and the strip mall is 5 million bucks. Well, a lot of individuals, especially if they're not active real estate investors, might look at that and say, that is totally out of reach for me. I, I, can't, I can't do that uh, right now. But if you start to break it down and you say, hey, well, look, we can get 80% financing. So really all we need is a million bucks, right? And all of a sudden you have 10 folks who have a hundred grand either in cash or more likely from their retirement accounts, and you pool together 10 folks at 100 grand and you have a million bucks, and then two of them are co-signers on the loan because they have very stable income and they're super lendable, all of a sudden you're now part of a partnership that owns a $5 million strip mall, right? And, and so it's that notion and introducing the mechanics of how to make that happen that I consider private equity. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I uh, appreciate that. I want to go back to your your business. So um, we kind of left off at like you 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 had like three or four duplexes, triplexes. Then you started raising money. Um, what does your portfolio look like now? Yeah. So we um, so the Diversus Fund uh, D I V E R S U S is a fund that sits over um, a couple of different integrated projects. So one of them, we own a vacation rental company. It's a management company, um, and it also owns real estate called Rental with a View in San Diego. Um, all of our properties have to have a view. That's sort of our niche, right? Get rich in a niche. That's another mentor saying of mine. Pick a specific lane and then ride it, you know? Um, and so that portfolio has anywhere from, you know, 12 to let's say 25 units at any given point in time. Um, we liquidated quite a few uh, units when the market was super frothy about uh, you know eight to 12 months ago. Some of the prices, particularly in Southern California, just seemed bonkers. And um, what's really nice about owning a short-term rental is that when you go to sell it, you can... Um, position it as a business, right? Because it really is. And you have cash flow and operational history whereby you're not just selling it to a individual buyer, you're, you're potentially selling it to an investor who is valuing that stream of cash flow much more than they're just valuing the sticks and bricks of the home, 
which is what a you know an owner occupant might do. And so, you know, post immediately post COVID, there was a pretty big spike in occupancy and also in, in nightly rates. So we had really strong pro formas uh, coming into the end of 2021. And we leveraged those pro formas to exit out of a few of our units. But we're a small boutique, ultra luxury, short-term rental company in Southern California. Um, and that's what that portfolio looks like. Um, and just a quick note on the ultra luxury side, uh, really, we try to invest in macroeconomic trends that are undeniable, right? Where you don't have to guess what's going on. All you have to do is get in the path of progress and you should be okay. So one of the big trends that's you know undeniable is that the rich are getting richer and unfortunately, the poor are getting poorer. Almost 40% of Americans live have a $500 a month housing budget or less. And so we want to be able to participate in that trend. So we invest in um, affordable housing, particularly in mobile home parks, where we can go in, pick up a park that's been dilapidated, improve it, make it a much better place to live, um, raise the rents, and do well, but also do good. That's a big part. So we're investing in the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And we don't really dabble too much in the middle. Um, we don't do multifamily. We don't do commercial. We only do luxury hospitality and affordable housing. So our experience in California um, led us to start searching the globe for other places where we could take our hospitality experience and bring it to an evolving market. As you know, the price of land and the price of property in California is prohibitively expensive to the point where really the only people I think who are generating double digit cash flow is folks who figured out the short term rental world. Um, otherwise, single family homes just are not going to do it. Um, so that's really what led us to Belize about a decade ago. Uh, it's an English speaking country, former British Commonwealth. Tons of Americans are moving there. Tons are visiting. It's a very unique space in that it's kind of it's more like the U.S. than it is like Central America or the Caribbean. Um, you can use the U.S. dollar there. And I've been visiting since 1999. And, and so we kind of started thinking, well, where would be a place that's like the U.S., but isn't the U.S., but could have the opportunity to see a tremendous amount of growth? And that's really how we settled on Belize. And we could talk more about those projects. Um, but that's kind of what the portfolio looks like now. So it's it's domestic short-term rentals, it's international hotels, um, and then it's mobile home parks uh, throughout the United States. Belize, uh, I think that country became a little bit more well-known um, because, you know, uh, McAfee, the, the guy who invented that virus software, antivirus software? Of course. How, how could you not? Just just saw the docu <laughs> just saw the documentary on Netflix a couple of weeks ago. Oh, you saw it a few weeks ago. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's funny because like when I was young, I I used that software and just to see that uh, the documentary is kind of that guy's kind of nuts. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's no longer. So you know. Yeah, he's he, no longer. <laughs> yeah, he he definitely didn't give it the best reputation, but I mean, he was. Um, you know, he, he saw in it what a lot of people see in it today, right? He had the foresight of recognizing that it's an interesting market. And I think folks who visit there cannot help but get on the plane back home with this sense that this is a land of tremendous opportunity. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. Vail or Aspen or Waikiki Beach in the 1930s, you know? And the problem is a lot of people go to these markets with they're bright eyed and bushy tailed and they have big visions and dreams. Um, but they don't realize the amount of operational complexity that it takes to actually build something and then run it. So we learned about that, um, through our experience in building the Hilton, uh, which is by far the largest resort in the country. Uh, it's called the mahogany Bay village, uh, at Hilton resort, uh, 180 plus doors. And so we cut our teeth on that project and have now moved to our second project, which is uh, uh, Six Senses, uh, which was voted the number one hotel brand in the world three years in a row by Travel and Leisure. And they're all about having a very boutique, bespoke kind of 
experience where you're not on a trip, right? It's not about um, lavish lobbies and opulence. It's about being touched and having an emotional experience that you don't forget because you're in an amazing, unique place and interacting with amazing, unique people. And that brand is a perfect fit for this market. So we've worked for the past five years to obtain permission from the government to build um, what will probably be the largest overwater bungalow resort in the Western hemisphere. And our thesis was like, why do you have to get on a plane and fly 20 hours to the Maldives or Bora Bora just to stay in a little hut over pretty water? <laughs> I mean, we have that right here, you know? So we wanted to bring that experience to the masses, particularly in North America, and Belize is the absolute perfect place to do that. So we have a great piece of land. We have an amazing brand and we have the operational experience. Now we're bringing that all together to really define a new market there, which is ultra luxury. The only yeah. other major brand doing a similar thing is the Four Seasons that's uh, building a nine hole golf course resort on an island about 15 miles away from us. Incredible, man. We could do a whole new podcast on, uh, on all the lessons that you've learned building uh, building your first hotel, I'm sure. Um, and uh, have you heard of uh, Bocas del Toro in Panama, by the way? Absolutely. That's another overwater bungalow place. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's what I was thinking. Actually, uh, before I moved to the US in the, in the next few months, that's uh, the number one highest priority for me here in Panama is to go to Bocas del Toro. And it's... Uh, it looks kind of similar to what I'm looking at behind you. <laughs> so, so imagine if you could invest in Bocas del Toro and own a piece of that for 50 grand. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what, you know, that, that is exactly what private equity means. Um, and in fact, we're still raising a little bit of capital for this deal. We're, in, we're in our final friends and family round. Um, you know, so if anyone's interested, they can contact me offline, but to be able to point to that and tell your friends and family, Hey guys, I own a piece of this yeah. is, is amazing, you know, and it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. So absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm sure there's a, there's a lot of challenges involved in going, going abroad and building something you know, of that, of that size. Um, but like I said, we could do a whole other podcast on that, but, um, but yeah, let's, uh, you know, we're uh, running out of time here. We've been, uh, this has been awesome, by the way. I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge on all of this. What, uh, and do you have any final thoughts or on, on this topic? Yeah, I guess it, the number one key learning that I think I dawned on over time, uh, I think that probably the biggest mistake I made in the beginning was not partnering the right deal with the right investor. That's super important, right? Because in the beginning, you're happy to just kind of Take, like a check is a check, right? <clears throat> but the reality is that you need to be interviewing that investor just as much as they're interviewing you, right? You need to understand what does catastrophe look like for this person, right? Let, let's say that we're doing a deal in Belize and our projections say that we're going to be open in, you know, three years and generating a 25%, you know, IRR by year five or whatever, well, what happens if it takes seven years, right? What I mean, I had a bunch of folks who are already retired invest in my first Belize deal, and they were counting on income within a very short amount of time, right? That is not the perfect match, right? When you're doing mm -hmm. something speculative in a for foreign country, and your investor is somebody who is really counting on, you know, regular dividends or cash flow. Um, you have to take pause and say, hey, you know, look, sir, I just want you to know this is kind of what we think is going to happen, but here are all the possibilities. And all of the paperwork is full of language about the risks. But at the end of the day, nobody reads that stuff. They're investing because they trust you and they know you. They're investing in you, right? So I think if you're somebody who has a lot of Airbnb experience, and you know what the run rate looks like from zero. In other words, I don't have a property in mind. I'm just out there looking. I know I want to add to my portfolio. I know I need some cash, right? You really have to paint the picture of what does the trajectory look like? And then you have to find a person who completely understands that trajectory and is happy with it, right? Because 
as we all know, I mean, the second you do all of your remodeling, right, which is expensive, and you open up for business, right, you hit that push to Airbnb button, now you're live. Well, you still have to pay the mortgage, you still have to pay taxes, you still have to pay insurance, and you may not have all the heads and beds that you need for six months before you bring, right? You may not be profitable for 18 months. In the hotel industry, the standard ramp up time is 24 months from opening till steady state, right? And during those two years, you will have expenses. And sometimes you may not have enough income to cover your expenses. So you have to go back to those investors and say, hey guys, everybody needs to put in another 3% or whatever. So just know your audience and know your deal, right? And just understand that this is a marriage. This is a partnership. Mm -hmm. And this, the more transparent you can be, the, the more you can resist that urge to just take the cash, um, the better you'll sleep in the long run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Makes sense. No, I love that. Um, we really have to make sure that, uh, that it's a good fit between the investor and, uh, and the deal that we're, uh, that we're looking to do. Um, Awesome, man. Well, how can people get in touch with you if they want to if they want to connect with you? Yeah, so you can find us on all the interwebs. Um, we're on LinkedIn. It's uh, Diversus D I V E R S U S like Divers U S uh, Fund dot com. And um, yeah, you can email me directly, Daniel at diversusfund dot com. Just Google it, and uh, be more than happy to share any key learnings advise folks of new opportunities that we're working on and uh, really just be a resource to exchange ideas. So uh, awesome, man. You. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on and uh, yeah, we might be able to do another podcast uh, on, on the topic of like, uh, you know, your experience of building a hotel in a foreign country. That'd be, that'd be amazing at some point to, to learn about as well. Anytime. Happy to do it. Awesome, Danny. Thank you so much. And for the listeners, hope you enjoyed this uh, this podcast. And if you want to look, uh, if you want to see what Belize looks like, then uh, go ahead and check us out on YouTube. We have all the all the podcast episodes are uh, on video uh, on YouTube, so you can see Danny's background here, and uh, looks pretty awesome. You probably want to book your ticket to Belize right away. So thank you for listening. Have a have a great week, and we'll be back on Friday. <laughs>